Halton here. At MSA, our health and safety drives them to develop advanced safety equipment with performance and protection in perfect balance, like Globe Athletics, the latest innovation in turnout gear. Developed as athletic gear for firefighters, Athletics uses unique stretch fabrics that provide body contoured fit for unprecedented range of motion and flexibility. It's lighter weight, less bulky, and provides the protection you need from your turnout gear. Get the full story at msafire.com slash globe. Hey, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Welcome to Fire Engineering Talk Radio. Another installment to the Professional Volunteer Fire Department, the podcast that is dedicated to our great on, volunteer right fire now. service and getting everybody to embrace the message that being considered professional has nothing to do with earning a paycheck and everything to do with delivering competent and compassionate service and taking care of not only our customers but our own members as well. Tom Merrill here. Glad to have you with me. This may be a short podcast. We seem to be having all sorts of technical issues this evening. My caller, for whatever reason, is unable to hear me. And I've had him call in several times, and I had a great show lined up for tonight. And I keep trying to invite him in. But it is not working. I'm sure you can hear him. But uh, unfortunately major issues here this evening we're going to keep trying he dropped again we're going to try and have him call in one more time and uh see if we can't uh get this to work so i'm glad you're with me if you could just stay with me for a minute here while we try and connect and uh see if we can't get our guest tim pillsworth to come on with us this evening and uh, talk about turnout gear. We had a great show lined up for tonight. A lot of good questions. We are going to ask them. Today is Tuesday, November 10th, 2020. And I'm going to ask Tim to try and call in again one more time and uh, see if we can't refresh here and see if uh, see if we get him to come in with us. Tim, are you there? We're going to try one more time. And hopefully we can get Tim on board with us. I don't know uh, what the issue would be. Everything seems to be up and working on my end. So thanks for bearing with me. And we're asking him to call in again. This is 760-454-8852. If any of my listeners want to call in on that number, see if uh, problems uh, on the podcast end or somewhere else, uh, give it a try. 760-454-8852 is the number we ask you to call in on. And uh, can't explain why it uh, doesn't seem we start. I always start to have my guests call in 15 minutes early to make sure all everything's lined up and working. And we've been working on it for those 15 minutes and unable to solve it. So uh, we'll see what's going to happen here. Might have some technical difficulties here tonight. <clears throat> Waiting for Tim's number to show up in the uh, queue. And he's telling me it's not picking up. So, folks, definitely some technical difficulties. I apologize. I try to have everything up and running well ahead of time. And uh, I always start early, as you well know, with my advertisements. And I get my guests to call in early, too. And I've never in the five years I've been doing this had any issues. All right, he did call in again. And we'll see if we can get him this time. Tim, are you there? Yes, sir. We finally got you. I say we blame it on the COVID. <laughs> well, well, I'm just glad we finally connected. I cannot explain, and I was just saying to the listeners in the five years that I've been doing the show, that's the first time that's ever happened. And uh, who knows, something with the Internet spectrum or cyberspace or whatever, but I'm just glad. You can hear me okay, Tim? I can hear you fine, Tom. I, I say we just blame it on the – my 10th grader calls it the Rona. I say we blame it on the Rona. <laughs> what the hell? It's 2020, and it's just tired for the course, right? I tell you, this year has been uh, uh, <laughs> insane at best. I yes, can't even it has. say insane. It's a, you know, thankfully, we've been healthy, but it's been uh, tough on everybody. Yeah, for sure. And So technical glitches aside – Again, I, I, listeners, I just want to thank you for bearing with me there. What a, what a rough beginning we had. But, again, thank you for listening in this evening, November 10th, 2020. Again, Tom Merrill here for this installment of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. Again, it's the show that defines 
the premise that being considered a professional firefighter has nothing to do with earning a paycheck. It has everything to do with delivering competent and compassionate service and taking care of not only our customers but our own members as well. Folks, I say it every show, developing and maintaining a professional reputation simply is the duty of all firefighters, paid or volunteer. And again, before the show begins, I'd like to thank Fire Engineering and Chief Bobby Halton and Clarion Events for supporting these podcasts, mine as well as all the other great podcasts that cover so many topics within our fire service. And I'm so honored that you choose to listen into my show, and I remain committed to all of you that continue to focus on topics of relevance, of importance to our wonderful, iconic volunteer fire service. So... All glitches aside, tonight I'm going to launch right into our program is we're going to spend some time talking about something we probably don't take we probably take for granted and we probably don't think about it too often and that's our turnout gear. Only recently it seems has it been getting a little bit more attention. It's been talked about a little bit more often than maybe it has in the recent past and that's great because we should know our equipment. We should have a basic understanding of it, right? But it can be bad, too, because with some of the recent information we're finding out, it's maybe going to scare some of us. And you might not look at the gear the same way again. I remember when I first joined my volunteer fire department, which, by the way, was 38 years ago this month, the month of November 1982. Stopped into my volunteer firehouse my first night on duty. They simply threw some gear to me. That was it. No one spent any time going over it with me. No one talked about the limits of its protection. Obviously, back then, it was rubber boots and a long coat and probably at least a generation old and probably two sizes too big. And not just because I'm a short little guy, but that's just how we rolled back then. (laughs) The, the, The only other time before recently in my career that I can recall turnout gear getting some attention was maybe when the big push came to go to complete bunker gear, which was in the late 80s, early 90s in many areas, maybe a little bit earlier, but that was definitely a big cultural change when we went to complete bunker gear. But anyway, here we are today. Bunker pants and pretty much fully encapsulated firefighters are now the norm. But it brings about it some very real safety concerns that we're just now beginning to understand. The very gear that's designed to protect us can in some ways be harming us. So I want to spend some time tonight talking about our turnout gear so we can all gain a better understanding about the gear and how it's assembled and what we can do to protect ourselves and understand it as volunteers often operating on a very limited budget Obviously, a lot of us relying on second or even third-hand turnout gear, but what can we do today with what we have to get the best protection and also protect ourselves? And also, possibly, we can lay the groundwork for a future show and discuss ideas on how to properly spec our gear. Maybe your department gets a grant or is set to do a once-every-generation full-on replacement of the gear for your members. Maybe we can talk in a future show and offer ideas on how to draw up specs and what you should include and ideas to put in the process to make it go a little bit easier. I really think that would be a good subject for a future show. But for tonight's show, I brought in a subject matter expert And I'm pleased to welcome him to the show after 10 attempts at dialing in. I'm glad he's finally here and live with us. And I would like to welcome Tim Pillsworth to the show. He is very passionate about our great volunteer fire service. He no doubt certainly shares our values and supports the professional premise that I talked about earlier that all firefighters should strive to be professional. And he has been active in our volunteer fire service since 1986. He's currently a firefighter EMT in the Washingtonville, New York Fire Department. He's a past chief and a life member of the Winona Lake Engine Company, the Orange Lake Fire Protection District in Newburgh, New York. He's also employed as a project engineer for the Army Corps of Engineers at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. And I met him at FDIC, where he's presented many times over the years, presented at many other conferences as well on a wide variety of subjects, including engine company operations and leadership. And he's also authored and co-authored many articles regarding our great volunteer fire service. 
and he is in fact the author of the PPE chapter in the Fire Engineering Firefighter 1 and 2 training manual, which is why I brought him on board tonight, because he is certainly well qualified to talk with us this evening about turnout gear and what we should know about it, how it's put together, what we're finding out about it today, about maybe some of the chemicals that are used to waterproof it or in some other way make it more protected, uh, protect us a little bit better, and what we should know as volunteers to not just be more aware but to take some steps to protect ourselves and properly take care of our turnout gear. So, hello, Tim, are you there? I am. And we still hear you. That's a great thing. Welcome to the show, buddy. I'm glad you're here. Thanks, Tom. It's, it's kind of funny. Like, uh, you give all those intros and stuff. And uh, what's interesting, if people don't realize, uh, Tom and I met at FDIC oh, a handful of years ago. And uh, I, I can't remember who sent the first email to each other first on one of the articles in fire engineering that one of us wrote. And then uh, I went and um, I showed up to fire engineering and you were at FDIC and you were teaching your class. And I just kind of snuck in, and we never saw each other face to face. And at one of the breaks that came up, and uh, we shook hands, and uh, we—I jo- jokingly accused you of stealing my stuff, and we started talking <laughs> I remember about that. stuff, and, and and we realized that neither of us saw each other's presentation before, but with just changing our words, you're saying, and some of the words are almost matching. It was kind of scary. We're saying we had the same mindset and a lot of stuff, and uh, since then we've been. We talk back and forth a lot, and uh, we talk on a regular occasion. And it's uh, what FDIC. If anyone has not been able to go there, please go there. It is it is such a privilege to present there. But uh, as much of just presenting in front of the people there, you get so much just from talking to everybody there, and you learn much more than you can give. It's amazing. Absolutely, and you know it was a good time to mention too that FDIC is open for business, and they're. Uh, they're taking hotel reservations and uh, go to FDIC.com for information and I talk about it so often on this show it is the premier firefighting trade show and the networking opportunities in addition to the great training second to none second to none and and uh, Tim and I will both be there, and we look forward to meeting all of you and talking to you about our great volunteer fire service. And he's so right. We share the exact same thoughts about our wonderful volunteer fire service and and, and all of us striving to deliver uh, the professional message. And it's just great to meet people like you who do share that and you know, it makes you realize that, okay, I'm not crazy with my thoughts and my ideas. <laughs> it makes it feel a little bit more sane that maybe there's one person in the world that thinks like you. <laughs> right, for sure. So, again, listeners, FDIC coming up in April in Indianapolis. It is still on. It is still a go, and they are taking reservations now. And go to FDIC.com for more information as to how you can get hotel reservations. Start looking over to class choices, and we'll see you there in Indy in April. So, so Tim, like I said, I'm so glad to have you on the show. And before we delve into the subject of turnout gear, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself, maybe what got you into the fire service, and a little bit about your fire service journey and how you ended up uh, you know, through the different positions and where you are today. Well, I started in upstate New York. I grew up outside of Albany in a small town called Castleton, a little village. And ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to be a fireman. Uh, I can't tell you why. Um, uh, I went to college and uh, uh, community college, and I went down to the local fire, volunteer fire department, put an application, and it was almost the same thing. A month later, they called me, swore me in. Uh, here's your pants. Here's your coat. Here's your fireball gloves. Your helmet. Um, okay, you can't ride on these, these two pieces yet unless directed. This is how you stand on the back of the truck. This is the jump seat in the open cab. And if you get there, just find an old guy and stand next to him. And that was the initial training back in the early 80s. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, and uh, I, I was lucky enough to catch the tail end of the uh, chimney fire era where people were uh, with the, all the oil embargoes and the high prices and people modifying their the heating system. So I, I got a lot of uh, good fires were fires in the wall and old balloon frame and the fires in the basement. Why am I going to the attic? You know, and learned all that type of stuff. So it really got me into, you know, I learned a lot quickly in an apartment that didn't have a lot of money. Uh, I never thought much about things except you just do it. You, you do the job with what's at your hands, and that's it. Wow. Yeah, so many of us, I bet, can, especially those of us that came in in the 80s, can relate to that beginning because I think it, a lot of us mirrored that same beginning in our careers. 
Definitely, definitely. And you were just a couple of years before me, and it was the exact same thing. You're, uh, there wasn't the formal OSHA training at the time, and uh, it was firefighting essentials. It wasn't firefighter one and two at the time, and it was just you. You basically the, all your training was on the job training, and it was quite intense and quite quick. And you learned quickly, or you were not put in a situation where you could have any fun. Basically. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah, I think on the job definitely describes '80s training for sure. Just show up, kid. <laughs> We'll show you what to do. We'll You'll tell you what okay. to do. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. So how long there? How long did you stay there? And uh, what kind of offices did you hold there at your first department? I was there from 86 to 96. And uh, I made it all the way up to the captain. And uh, I, I met a girl in college, my now wife, Heather. And yeah, that uh, happens. <laughs> basically, yeah, it happened. And the weird thing was I couldn't uh, – she couldn't find a job by me. I couldn't find a job by her. So we kind of drew these uh, circles and both had an, uh, an hour commute, and I moved down to the town of Newburgh, uh, the crossroads in the northeast in Orange County. And the town of Newburgh was a nice, bustling little town. It was great. Uh, moved in November – moved over in July, and I'm like, let me uh, give it a couple months. And I joined the department there in, like, October, and it was great. They uh, were a busy department. We ran uh, – you know, five, six hundred runs a year, covered two major interstates. And my my thought was, I'm not going to be an officer for a while. I'm just going to, you know, just be a you know black hat, a dumb guy in the line. Uh, a little over a year in, we had one of our lieutenants move away, and the chief at the time calls me in the office. He goes, bring your helmet. I'm like, oh, I'm getting a new helmet. Cool. And uh, he goes, he, I handed him my black helmet. And he gave me a yellow one. I'm like, what's this for? He goes, you, you've been promoted. Move your rack. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, boy. And then uh, just worked my way up to the ranks of chief. You know, wow. Which was so the same thing. They saw did, something in you, that's for sure, huh? Not even elected, just here you're being promoted. <laughs> I'm not sure if I was promoted or punished. I wasn't quite sure at the time. <laughs> <clears throat> and so then that had to be hard to go. Uh, that had to be hard to leave that department, that? right? You go to you go to be chief, and then you had to move on, right? Yeah, um, we moved uh, uh, almost 10 years ago now, um, and we moved. It's, I'm, I'm in a small village called the Village of Washingtonville, um, kind of like where I grew up upstate New York. And we do about 300 runs a year. But um, our schools in the town of Newburgh shared uh, – it didn't have a great school district. So I had two young boys at the time, and we had a choice of, um, like a lot of parents do, what do I do with my kids, uh, private schools or better school districts. So we made the choice to move. And uh, thankfully, uh, Billy and John have flourished in the new schools. Uh, my older son's at the uh, University of New Haven, contracted with the U.S. Army for ROTC. We're hoping for a scholarship. They cut a lot of money. Um, vice yeah. president of his uh, lacrosse club, um, an Eagle Scout. And my younger son's a, a sophomore in high school, a life scout. I was a scout master for five years, and uh, they're both doing very well in school. And uh, it's it was the right move. Uh, it is tough to move. I go back. And it's, uh, it's weird looking at the old rigs. It's uh, it's weird, but yeah, you, know, you have yeah. to do it what's right to your family. Absolutely, yeah, and you did. That's not an easy thing to do, especially when you're well established in a department. And anyone that served as a chief of department is certainly well established in their fire department. And to move on to another one, and you just gave me a topic for another show. I'm writing it down right now. Uh, changing departments because a lot of volunteers do that. So I don't want to get off track here, but that's a great topic for another show because it can't. I guess it can't be that easy, but there's probably things that can make it easier. So we'll save that for another show. You think that would make for a good show? I wrote an article on it for Fire Engineering a number of years ago. I think it was Jerry Knapp that goes, "You should do an article on that." I think it was called <laughs> "Starting Over Again." It was, and it was weird. It, it, it we're, boy, we're doing a, a left hand turn on this one, but it's true. Starting over again is not an easy thing. And I've done it twice, and it's uh, it's you get a different outlook on things. There's some there's a lot of great about it, and there's some some difficult about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just wrote myself a note, so listeners, we'll we'll schedule that one for down the road a little bit, but a topic for another day. So, so Tim, you've been involved in the fire service for for a little while now. <laughs> All right, I've been there a few more years longer than you, but we're old timers, right? And uh, you old. obviously have been involved in a lot of different things. I know engine ops is a great passion of yours, so is leadership, pretty much anything volunteer fire service related. So i got to ask you, 
what sparked your interest in turnout gear? Because we all have different interests, especially as we put time in the volunteer fire service. You've become very interested in turnout gear. You've taught yourself a lot about it. You've taught other people a lot about turnout gear. But what got you going on that? Um, it was kind of weird. Uh, I came from a small department upstate New York that didn't have a ton of money. And we basically purchased what we could afford. Uh, moved down in the town of Newburgh and moved into a department with two stations. And uh, we had chief trucks and, uh, you know, a lot of runs and a lot of money. And we basically had the same set of gear I had upstate New York. Um, we were actually at the time using a, a modern style helmet. You know, that's a personal choice. I prefer traditional, but be that as it may. Um, the same type of coat, the same type of pant, the rubber boots. And I was just looking at it, and I was looking at departments around us. I'm like, you know, we have the money that we could do better. So I started really looking into it. And in the 90s, uh, in late 90s is when all the turnout gear really started. They started coming out with the ergonomically correct design gear. Uh, and I started getting into it. We started uh, doing a lot of it, uh, searching and information. And this is before the Internet. You can basically just type something in and find it. So it took a lot of legwork. Uh, then the fire grants came out from FEMA. And uh, uh, I was thankful enough. I wrote one for my department, and uh, we won a lot of money. And we bought 100 sets of turnout gear, 50 for each station. So then I had to really get smart on it. And to sell what I was thinking about getting, I had to uh, convince two stations, two companies, um, we went from black gear to tan gear. It was basically like uh, taking someone's firstborn son. Um, we changed basically everything. Uh, we went to leather boots. We changed the style of helmet, uh, the color of our gear, the layout of our gear, and they just kind of moved it forward. And from that, uh, they made a really smart purchase program where they buy, no matter what they buy, I think they're up to like a, uh, six to eight sets per station per year to rotate them through to get to that 10-year cycle. And it worked out pretty well, and they have the money to do it. And every few years, they go back out to bid um, and update it for either updates in NFPA or, you know, this is something we want to change a little bit because things have changed. We now um, They now have internal harnesses in their gear instead of the externals because that's now uh, an option. And that's how I kind of got into it. And then with the book uh, – uh, Glenn Colbert was talking to Jerry Knapp and Jerry was hired to do engine company stuff for it. And, yeah, I'm looking for a guy for gear. And Jerry's like, I got a guy. And that's how I ended up doing it. Yeah, oh, it's amazing. So it's funny, you know, you, you identified a need and then you got lucky enough to, you know, and worked hard enough to get the grant. But boy, once you got that notification that, hey, congrats, you're getting a grant. I imagine you had to do a lot of on-the-job training to really get yourself to understand what makes up gear and, and 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 you did more than just gear you went beyond the turnout gear when you say you did helmets and boots as well right yep yep um we started the boots uh when i started the gear we had um a couple ankle injuries uh just thankfully nothing too serious a bunch of sprained ankles um we covered the stuff on the interstates uh the throughway and interstate 84 and in the medians, there's always these chuck holes and stuff. And we had a couple different guys from both stations roll their ankles over like a six to eight month period. And they didn't deal rubber boots or like someone came up, we should try leather boots. And we tried a couple test pairs. So that was already in the start before we did the grant. But it was, uh, we just basically, head to toe, we changed everything. Mm. And it was just the right, it, we struck when the iron was hot and by just sometimes luck, uh, that works out, and we made out really well. Yeah, yeah. Maybe for the listeners, you can do a brief review of, or a, just an overview of where we come with gear. Like, um, what have you seen some of the big changes in the whole evolution of turnout gear? I mentioned a little bit at the very beginning, but um, just in your career, um, what what are some of the milestones, and where have we evolved from to where we are today? Um, you, you touched on it yourself. You, when we first joined our era, we're basically uh, 80s kids. Uh, we had the three-quarter boots, the long coats, and if you remember the old fireball gloves, and you talked to Jeff Shoup, he's got some great stories about those. Um, we didn't have hoods yet. We had the ear flaps. So, and that was basically your coat. Um, 
some of the tests that test the gear now didn't even exist at the time. They were they they tested the gear uh, for thermal protection by like the thickness. Um, the TPP test didn't come out until oh, 85, 86 in the NFPA. And then gear started changing back then in the late 80s into the early 90s. Okay, you had the same coat, you got a pair of pants cut off your three-quarter boots. Then we started getting the, the bunker boots. And then the gloves started improving. We started getting standard hoods just for basically thermal protection. And now we're up to full garments that are designed, if you think about um, uh, ergonomically correct suits. If you, if you order a, uh, a tailored suit, I never ordered a tailored suit because what I do for a living and I work for the government, can't afford a, tailor, a homemade <laughs> suit. But they, they adjust it to your body style. Are you short? Are you tall? Are you athletic? Are you skinny? Uh, are you chubby? Um, now they have them cut for both male and female figures. Obviously, male bodies are different than female. And that was that whole change. And then it was not even that, how they protect us. The, 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 the TPP value, the thermal protection uh, values, the heat loss values. And it all came in, how much reflective striping, where to put it, uh, you know, pockets. You know, I'm not a big fan of uh, too many pockets and loops on gear. It kind of gets hung up. Like you, you want the right amount to make your gear function for you. And then the whole argument of um, what ty- type of helmet, modern versus traditional, leather versus composite. It, you know, that's still always an argument. Leather versus rubber boots. It's and the whole industry has changed, and now it's our gear is now as advanced as our apparatus, basically. Yeah, and I think what uh, happens is, again, thinking of the traditional volunteer fire department, whether they're doing a whole-scale generational change of gear or piecemealing it, getting five sets second-hand from this department, maybe ten sets third-hand from this department, sometimes people don't put a lot of thought into the gear that they're wearing and, and even understanding some of those standards and thresholds that you just mentioned, TPP, among others. We're going to get into that in a second. But I think it's important for the members to understand a little bit about the gear they're wearing. You know, I remember when just having gear, again, when it was just thrown at me when I joined, and that was it. There was no explanation. And, again, it was definitely two sizes too big for me, and all I knew was I could barely walk there, I thought I could. I, I was tripping over it, but I was under the impression, okay, I have this fire gear. I can bravely walk through any fire, and that gear is going to be there to protect me from everything. And nowadays, we realize, or we should anywhere, that we got to do a better job educating our members a little bit more about what they're wearing. We got to recognize that it's not going to protect them from everything, and there are things that uh, we need to do to properly care for the gear. And I know nobody reads that booklet that comes with each set of turnout gear, but I want you to. Go down to your firehouse, see if you can pull out one of those little instructional booklets or informational booklets that comes with each set if you were fortunate enough to maybe get a brand new set of gear. Just see if you can get your hands on something like that. We actually make that booklet part of our recruit orientation program, not to read it cover to cover at all, but I would sit down with the recruit, and simply explain to them, here's a 20-page document about the gear you're wearing. And we would just go through a few of the pages, not reading all the size 6 fonts, what there is to read about it, but the 20-point font in red, warning, hazard, be aware, warning, danger, hazard, all through the booklet. And the point there was, hey, you got to know about this gear, what it can do for you and what it can't do for you because it doesn't protect you from everything. And I think we need to highlight that and make that part of maybe not even just our recruit training, but regular ongoing training with our members as well. Yeah, I agree with that. It's kind of funny. I, you, know, you can laugh at me later when we're sitting at FDIC having a beer. Yeah, I read it cover to cover. Um <laughs> I would beach. expect you to. You wrote articles about turnout gear, so you, yeah, I would expect that of you. <laughs> but what's funny is, uh, if you look at it, it's almost like looking at a step ladder. Uh, the step ladder tells you all the things you don't supposed to do. If you look at the label, just look at the label on the inside of your gear. It'll have the born on date. It'll have the specs of your gear, with your outer shell, uh, your moisture barrier, thermal liner, what all those materials, how thick they are, or you know the size or the weight. And that'll be warning, 
you know, firefighting is a dangerous business, uh, can cause grave harm or even death. And you're like, no, oh, that's, that's not what that's I signed up for. <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. And, Put and that one in thing to remember, sure. and, and I talked about years ago, and I wrote in the articles and in my presentation, I go, if our turnout gear is, pr- is uh, resistant to a lot of things, but it's not proof of anything. It's not fireproof, bombproof, stab proof, and I'm proof that I, I took a, I got a very seriously uh, puncture wound to my leg from glass. Jerry Knapp got blown up in a gas explosion, not to laugh because he's fine, thank God. But you think about it, our gear is resistant to a lot of stuff, but it's not it's not anything proof. Yep, yep, nothing which is, is... Which is important. Right, right, and that's why nothing's is, nothing protects you more than your training and your your own mind to steer you in the right direction. Exactly. Use it for your first line of defense. But don't count it on it for your last because it will protect you only to a point, and that is you're in the hands of God. <laughs> yeah, we just hope yeah. we never. We don't want to get to that point. It's scary. So, what do you think we should have our members understand about the gear? Let's briefly talk about how the gear is made up. What, how is our gear assembled? Is it basically three layers, right? Can you maybe talk a little bit about you know, just just what our a, a good professional firefighter should know about their gear? If you know, if Joe Citizen just asked about the gear. How's this made? They should know some basics about it. Maybe you could talk briefly about that. Well, our our pants, coats, and gloves. The, the, the pants and the coats will have to match, but they're three layers. You have the outer shell. That's what everyone sees. Are you in tan gear, black gear, yellow gear, blue gear? That outer shell is basically supposed to give you some water resistance, flame resistance. It's like uh, the idea of a, a car hard coat. It's really tough. It doesn't tear easy, and everything gets mounted to that. Underneath that is the most delicate layer, and that's the moisture barrier. That's what keeps water out. And, and lets your moisture wick out, almost like the idea. It's not Gore-Tex, but if you remember way back in the 80s and 90s, everyone was talking Gore-Tex. Oh, it's breathable. Well, that's part of it. And the innermost portion is your thermal liner. Um, it's it's a, usually a quilted-type material, fire-resistant, with different fabrics, and it acts just like a winter coat or your insulation in your wall. Uh, if you think of a, a – they talk about insulating your house. You have a wall cavity. If it's open – the heat will transfer directly through that air cavity to the inside. All insulation is it breaks that big air pocket into small, 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 teeny tiny air pockets. So you don't have direct movement through. And all that is is basically insulation. And you put those three layers together, and that is your coat and your pants. Your gloves are very similar, except it's just much thinner and the the materials are a little bit different. Uh, excellent. You so probably... it almost doesn't matter what what colors you have. Um, the colors of your gear, uh, if you have black gear, it's just been dyed. That's all it is. It's not the most fabrics. The natural color is a tan, uh, tannish type color, a natural kind of weedy type color. And I imagine there's different standards. There's probably minimum standards that all manufacturers have to meet with these three different layers, uh, certain criteria. So when you're, and again, a topic for another day is specking the gear, but there's probably some very minimum standards you want for all three of those layers, right? Yeah, there, it, it's not one layer or the other, but it's always tested as a composite. Um uh, the NFPA 1971, that's, that is the standard for basically uh, our PPE. And what they do is uh, kind of the three big tests. There's, there's other ones, but the ones most people talk about is first your uh, TPP, that's your uh, thermal protection. Um, that's how much protection I have from being burned. Um, that's based on uh, the minimum standard is a 35 35 is a weird number. 35 means nothing. 35 divided by 2 is 17 and a half. A 35 PPE means you'll have you'll start receiving secondary secondary second degree burns and a flashover situation in about 17 and a half seconds. That means your skin will reach between 120 and 130 degrees. Um, it's tested with this magical testing device that puts convected and radiating heat 
and it basically just absorbs energy on the other side and it puts it on a scroll, a scroll curve. Um, I think it was back in the 50s. Uh, uh, I think her name was Allison Scroll. They, they designed to figure out they, for burn injuries. And it was in the Navy, and people volunteered to be burned to a second degree burn and how long it took to get there, and they had to have a weekend leave. I'm like, it's, <laughs> you're pretty desperate to get off the ship if you want to get burned. But uh, I guess that was the military at the time. Um, and it, it's interesting is people think, well, I, the higher number, I, the better it is. So I want to get to 100. The one thing they found is anything really over a TPP value of about 60, they really can't test anymore because they really can't tell what – you almost can't put any more insulation in. And that 35 is basically anywhere on the garment. But due to overlaps, extra protection, and like that, if you do some searching online, just uh, uh, Google in TPP, PPE, you know, or something like that, you can get – there's great diagrams of – um, the newer NFPA has greater values in our knees. Why? Because we get compression spots in our knees. We get compression in our shoulders from our SCBAs. And that's like the TPP value. Um, the next big one is uh, the total heat loss, or THL. Uh, the easiest way to describe that, how well does your gear breathe? How well does it take that heat? In the middle of winter, uh, at a working fire, a working call, you're, you're sweating. You're, you're generating heat. How well does that garment release your heat and what's important about it is it's not a direct correlation but your higher your thermal protection typically the lower your heat release rate is so if you think about it the greater protection i have the less i can get heat we're up by us in the northeast we have to worry about it but if you can think about the people down at miami day like bill gudson I, I i talked to him a couple times like how do you wear that gear in July and August in Miami, and he goes to get used to it. I just look at him, I go, yeah, that's nice. Uh, <laughs> I can't see how they do it. And one of the big other things is uh, like a, uh, a tear, it's called a tap or tear, how strong your outer garment is from getting ripped. Um, you've gotten your stuff caught on things before, and you hear a rip, you're like, oh, okay, i got to get that fixed. Those are just a couple of tests, but if you get the NFPA and download that, uh, all the tests are described in there, the best thing to do is take the test out of that NFPA, put it in your computer and do a search and it explains it in layman's terms a lot better so we can all can understand it. Well, I'd be correct in saying I guess one of the things that would be important would be to find the right balance for your area with that. Uh, I think you said the higher the thermal protection is, the less heat release you have. So maybe find a balance for your area and in, in, in your climate Definitely, definitely. And also the type of calls you go to. Um, it, everybody wants to go in and go get the fire. And there's also a lot of uh, studies now on how, uh, with now with our SCBAs, our, our hoods, our gear, our cameras, we can almost sprint into a building now. It's not recommended. And we can go too far too fast. Where years ago, um, before we had all this wonderful protection, you got to a point you're like, okay, this is kind of sucking. I'm going to stay here and keep flowing water and not go any. Now we can get in so far, so deep, you can almost go too far, too fast, and be in that uh-oh place. Um, so you need to really do the idea of a hazard analysis. How many, how many fires do you go to a year? Um, what is your fire loading? Are you going to typical one, two-story family dwellings, or do you have big apartment buildings where you really – you know, you get into these big, massive cities where these guys are in a tenement building trying to go down a hallway. Well, they're going to take more of a beating and probably need more of a, uh, a thermal protection than like than we might have, where we just typically have uh, one and two family dwellings where you know it's it's a ten or twenty foot hallway we have to go to make it to the bedroom. So it's it's a little bit different depending on what your uh, requirements are. Yeah, yeah. So again, it's you know you can't just professional firefighters should know their weapon and know their armor and your gear is your armor. And, you know, we always talk about knowing your tools and knowing your nozzles and flow rates, but you should know your gear. And a good place to start would be to review the NFPA 1971, get an understanding of what gear you have today, get an understanding of maybe what your gear rating is. And uh, if you're going to be getting new gear, put some time and effort into educating yourself and talking with others about what would work in your department for not just your climate, but maybe what your bread and butter operation is. 
Definitely. And the one thing that um, I always hate to see, it, and it's not, it's not just turnout gear. Um, you see a lot of departments will go buy whatever someone else uses. Um, uh, I know departments that will buy something. We have a city not far from us, and they, they, oh, they switched to the tan because they did. Oh, they switched to the yellow helmets because they did. Um, uh, Keeping up with the Joneses. <laughs> yeah, where I'm, I'm, I really don't care the color of the gear. I really don't care the color helmet. I'm traditionalist. I think firefighters should wear a black helmet and leave the colored helmets to the officers. I think that's a nice way of doing it. It really doesn't matter. Um, a lot of times people will buy something because some big city has it. Might it be uh, Los Angeles, FDNY, uh, what, Chicago, Boston. The one thing to remember is every municipality, especially bids like this, are buying a low bidder. <laughs> so the reason that that company got in originally because they t- probably had the best cost, it doesn't mean they're the worst. But they had the best cost, and they want to keep the standardization of that gear for many, many years. So the idea, just because someone uses a specific manufacturer of gear or apparatus or extrication equipment or anything, doesn't make it the best. Uh, find out what's best for you. And it's, that's, you know, I wrote about that, and it's very important. Find out what's best for you. Yeah, for sure. And, folks, if you're starting out with, uh, with this, there, there's – a ton of information, a lot of great articles that Tim's written. You can find them all in the, uh, you know, I'm sure a Google search, but you go to Fire Engineering's website and there's a search bar there where you can search turnout gear and come up with all the different articles that have been written over the years. And uh, um, it's worth it. And it, it, Not only is it fascinating and interesting, and I, and I kid Tim about reading the instruction manual that comes with the gear cover to cover, but it is fascinating and interesting to learn more about how this gear is assembled, put together, and, and how it protects us. It's, and it's worth putting the time into understanding it even if you're getting second generation gear or third generation gear don't you want to know about it don't you want to know about its limitations don't you want to know about the good parts about it and understand how to care for it so it is worth the put, putting the time in it's part of being a professional firefighter yeah it, and it's one of the biggest things is uh I, I can say I think we're probably thankful, and uh, I'd say both our departments, you know, we had cheap trucks. We didn't, we didn't have to drill holes in the roof of our POVs to put lights and antennas on it, and uh, we, had, we had that luxury. But um, when we won the grant, uh, one of our uh, old-time members, his daughter lived someplace in, in Tennessee, I think it was, and her local department had nothing. And we boxed it up, and we, we even paid for the shipping. And we got a letter, letter back, and some, we actually took some stuff out we didn't feel comfortable sending to them. And they're like, this is the best gear we've ever had. And I'm like, I kind of felt guilty having brand-new gear because these people had nothing. So it's, there's, a, there's a lot of departments out there that are, are not that fortunate. So you need to think about your priorities and figure out what you need to do to protect your people. Right, right. And So up until – this recent history, we've really come a long way with our turnout gear and through the years until, until we're, where we are today. And we believe we have it pretty good, don't we? We think, uh, hey, it can't get any better than this, you know, between the waterproofing, the fireproofing, the resistance to rips and tears, the moisture wicking. I mean, we feel pretty good. We feel pretty safe. That gear is going to protect us. But some of the products in the gear we're finding out that are there to make it better, waterproof it or flame retardant uh, chemicals, we're finding they can actually be hazardous. And some of the information that has come to light recently in the recent past over the last couple of years is not only enlightening, but I find it a little scary. So I want to delve into that a little bit, if you don't mind, uh, Tim. What What's the deal with gear today? Or, or maybe I should ask, what's the recent data or information that seems to be coming to light in the relatively uh, recent past, as I said, that's got our industry above. What what are these? Remember, we're firefighters. We're listening. Those listening to the show, for the most part, are firefighters. So what are we talking about in layman's terms when we hear these chemical names, PFAS and PFOs and things like that? Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? What is this that's in our gear? I think... Um... I think the conversation on those products, uh, the polyfluorinated alkali substances, that's a PFAS, um, that kind of started with, um, 
I think, with contamination in water from the HFLS foam. That's where I think it all kind of started because it, everyone was talking about that first. And then soon after, uh, it started talking about the gear. So I think it all kind of started with contamination of water with foam. And we actually have it really down the road from my house. We have Stewart Airport, which is an old uh, uh, Army Air Base, now a uh, National Guard base. For, it started from World War II. Um, they contaminated the water system with, it, with, with that from foam drills. Those, those chemicals were pulled out of the foam in the 80s, I think it was late 80s. And all it was, it, uh, it's a surfactant. All it is is uh, foam is a uh, surface of surfactant. It basically breaks up the surface tension of the water so it can make foam and bubble and coat better. Uh, so all those chemicals were in there for a long time, and they stopped using the long chain ones. This is getting into uh, uh, chemical geeky stuff, stuff that I, I somewhat understand, but not completely. I just know it's bad. Um, and they're kind of classified as one of those... Uh, I think they call them like a forever chemical. Um, like the idea of a PCB, um, a PCB just never goes away. It's always there. It just doesn't degrade. And they also bioaccumulate. If you think about um, uh, all the PCB contamination in some of our lakes and rivers, they accumulate in the fatty tissues of the fish. That's why they don't want you to eat fish out of the Hudson River because of the PCBs. Um, so when it first started coming out in the foams, then somebody smart started realizing when we started talking about the cancer and the fire service in general, um, the cancer and the fire service really started gaining speed, um, unfortunately, years after September 11th because all the, the acute exposure to God knows what down at ground zero. Uh, they started looking at cancer and the fire service and started, that's where all these studies really started to gain, gain traction. And they realized that there's so many chemicals in the, the, the stuff we're breathing at a fire. We're supposed to be on air. We're supposed to be breathing air all the time. Uh, even during overhaul, because the stuff is just off-gassing this, these hideous materials. Now comes the, uh, the POFSAs. That was put on our outer shells in our thermal liners and our uh, moisture barriers to help wick water, to keep water from, to make them more water resistant. Who wants heavy, wet gear? It keeps it lighter. When our gear gets soaked through with water, we lose our thermal protection. If you think about it, um, if you ever heard anyone that had overheated gear, the worst thing to do is to go pat them. You're collapsing all the air pockets, they'll get burned. So you take off their gear as quickly without kind of collapsing all the gear on them. That's when they started finding out. And now uh, they pulled out all the long chain PFSAs from our gear years ago. But there's probably some stuff that's still left out there and the one question and comment, if you think about it, all these things, we think about PCBs, it was a wonderful insulator in um, electronics. Asbestos, the miracle fiber, brake linings, boiler linings, um, benzene solvents, it was the best solvent to be used in any ma in a machinery type place. All these wonderful chemicals at some point in the past were awesome. Now they're bad. I'm always concerned we're going to replace something, this chemical, with this chemical. Well, 50 years from now, how bad is that going to be? So right. I don't think we're going to change having that stuff around us right now. I think what needs to be done is, okay, yep, it's here. Check myself. How do I yeah. protect my crews? And that's where right. we need to probably concentrate now. They're going to take this stuff out, but if they eliminate it right now, you're not going to replace everyone's gear tomorrow. So it's still going to be right. there. Yeah, for sure. So for our firefighters out there, I think it's important to understand as a professional firefighter, and I'll call it just these chemicals. I won't get into whether they're long chain or PFAS or PFOs. I'm just going to call them chemicals. They've been around for a long time now. My research shows since at least the 1940s. These chemicals are in a very broad group, of, uh, very uh, used in a lot of different uh, industries. Uh, it's a very broad group. They can be found in food packaging, cleaning products, non-sticking products such as Teflon, that's considered a PFAS, I guess, heat and stain-resistant mm -hmm. products such as cookware uh, have also had some of these products in it. And, of course, what you just mentioned, waterproofing, <laughs> hence it gets into our turnout gear, Class B firefighting foams like AFFF, which is what brought the attention to this 
chemical, so huge, huge concern. I remember, if I can segue for a second, you're a product of the 80s. Maybe you have the same memory. Our AFFF training on a Wednesday night drill for us, we would fill a field somewhere with a mound of AFFF foam as we learned about the nozzles and the appliances and proper flow rates to get the good uh, blanket of foam. And we would wade through it. And I remember, don't worry about it, kid. It's like soap. And how many times did we wade through the AFFF foam? And someone, and someone guaranteed tackled somebody in the foam pile because it was funny when it was oh, all over. There's always someone who had the, the foam thing on top of their helmet. And it was, and you never really thought anything of it. I'm like, how bad can this be? Well, fast forward almost 40 years. Well, yeah, it wasn't such a great great idea at the time. And, and how many times did we take a handful of it and put it up to our mouth and blow on it to, to get it to go on somebody else? And yeah, now you look back on it because, again, we didn't know any better. We listened to the old timers because they didn't know any better either. So start finding out, okay, this is bad, this is bad. But And like you mentioned, it's by, it doesn't come out of the body quickly. It doesn't disintegrate. Um, and now we're finding that these chemicals are linked to all sorts of cancers and other health problems. And we all know that firefighters certainly have a higher cancer rate than the general public. So the bottom line as a professional is understand that these chemicals, these PFAS and PFOS, long chain, whatever you want to call them, they're not very good for you. And there are ways that the general public is exposed to them. And by the way, there's also a lot of chemicals that they're PFAS and PFOS that aren't harmless, that are harmless, that don't hurt you at all. It's a very small percentage that can harm you. Unfortunately, that small percentage applies a lot to the fire service. So there are ways, though, the general public's exposed to them, and that's concerning. But there's also ways firefighters are exposed to them. And there's three big ways that firefighters can be exposed to these chemicals. We've already mentioned a couple of them, such as the foam from years past, but uh, the gear can have that in there. We'll talk about how that gets into the body at some point. Also, we could be exposed to products of combustion, right? We go to fires. Things can be burning, upholstery and maybe stain-resistant carpeting, and it gets on us that way as well. So, Tim, it's not just foam. It's not just the turnout gear, but these chemicals are exposed to us by fighting fires. Yeah, if you think about it, like uh, what's interesting is if you we're both in our 50s and we remember probably going to our grandparents' house and they had these old, it was the old legacy type furniture um, that uh, uh, had the old heavy wood frames and it had cotton batting and it had metal springs. Uh, if you think about the, the idea of uh, that wonderful video that everyone uses where it has the legacy house burning and the modern house burning, and this thing's putt putting along for like 18, 19 minutes till it flashes over. And the other one is basically burning and it, it completely lights off in about three minutes. You think about it right now, everything we have in our homes is a, I'm actually doing this for my son's bedroom who's in college. So because my other son's on a, a virtual call for scouts. They shut down my school, uh, his school for a couple of weeks because of COVID. And you look at all the solid gasoline in here uh, the, the fleece blanket on his bed, uh, the plastic cup I'm drinking the water out of, all that is basically chemicals. Um, when they burn, they give off methyl ethyl bad stuff. And it, if you think about it, you know, 50, 60 years ago, our, our brethren were smoke eaters. Yeah, the stuff was bad. Now the stuff is toxic. Uh, yeah. It's stuff that is just horrible. And it's... Uh, we need to protect ourselves. And they put it in the gear. No one meant to do anything bad when they put it in the gear to make it more uh, water resistant. Um, it's considered stable when they put it in the gear, right? So how is it possibly harming firefighters? It's like anything. Um, you heat something up and you can change the properties of it. Uh, you think about way back in uh, your science classes where you heated up this piece of wood and it started to smoke, but it didn't have the oxygen. You added a, uh, an ignition source to it, and the smoke lit up. Um, 
you're basically heating, superheating stuff, things are going to start to off gas. They're going to start to come off. Um, if you think of any type of coating that's put on anything, and you touch it, it'll come off on your hand. Uh, you touch something, the oils on your hand are left behind. So things are transferred back and forth over time, and they're very stable chemicals, but you expose them to UV light, you expose them to high heat, it's going to change them, and it might not be the type of change you want. Yeah, yeah. And one thing I read about, too, that I found interesting is over time, the layers in the turnout gear rub against each other. You mentioned the three different layers that our gear is made up of, and PFAS are in the moisture barrier and in the outer mm-hmm. shell and uh, for the waterproofing, and they, they appear to migrate over time to the thermal layer. When they make the thermal layer, it's chemical or PFAS-free but it seems you accumulate PFAS it, over time. Yeah, because you think about it, uh, the water does penetrate your gear. There's nothing really truly waterproof. Everything's water-resistant to a time. And we've all had that uh, those alarms out in the pouring rain or you're operating a line out of call or whatever it might be. And over time, as your gear starts to break down, uh, the outer shell, your moisture barrier, won't be as perfect as brand new. So the water from the outside will start pushing into the stuff into the inside, and that's where your skin is. Yeah, yeah, and that comes in contact with your skin. And they're also finding the chemicals on the outside of the gear. They're not quite sure yet how it's gotten there, but I think it's pretty – a good assumption is possibly from the result of the products that are burning. (laughs) So it's all over. And then from there, it's getting into your body because you're coming in contact either through the skin or on your hands, and then you're touching your food. And so I would say just consider it everywhere. I I think that a a couple of years ago when they were talking before the the PFAB stuff came out or as big as it is now, there was a big push of um, cleaning your gear. Uh, and a number of years ago, I just literally, I started washing my hands when I left the firehouse, uh, a drill, a call, you know, it could be a nothing alarm where you literally just dine your gear, hop in the jump seat or drive the rig. We keep our rigs clean. I mean, they're, they're washed, they're clean, we, but you always had dirt on your hands. There's always oh, dirt. Yeah. We have a, a, a exhaust system for the, for the diesel exhaust, but it's always dirty. And I always notice, I'm like, wow, I got dirt on my hands. So I got in the habit of washing my hands. Uh, COVID hit, now everyone's washing their hands. The cancer studies, the way they started, and, um, it, the big change was the hoods. We didn't have any uh, particulate protection. It was just all thermal. Now they have a particulate layer. Uh, your body can absorb small particulates, over, and then your body heats up, and your pores open up so you can basically absorb stuff better. Uh, the most, okay, Excuse me, cat. My cat decided to hop on my lap. What are you doing, buddy? Um, Welcome to the show. And <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, the one cat is my son's best friend, and he sees somebody in his room, so he's hanging. Um, our most area that absorbs stuff the most readily, I'll kind of say it tongue in cheek, is our happy areas. You think about how thin the skin is, and how sensitive, and how many blood vessels there are there. So you're on an active call, and you get your hands all crapped up and you've got to go to the bathroom well let me sneak around the back of the engine or the back of the house to go to go go to the bathroom real fast we've all done it what's on your hands and what are you touching right Next right is your face um you've been to those calls where they come up with a bunch of sandwiches a, a cup of coffee uh, a donut and you just need calories because you're hungry well you pull off your gloves you grab the piece of pizza or the donut or whatever it might be and you inhale it well, did you wash your hands first? Um, now we have uh, a lot of places uh, have something, you know, the hero wipes or, or baby wipes. Um, we keep them at all the rigs, and when the guys are done with the call, it's a standard policy, basically hands, face, neck, anything that's exposed, wipe off right there. Um, if it's a longer alarm where, where you're going to basically get into nourishment, hey, guys, wipe down your hands before you, you, know, you grab that piece of pizza or donut or whatever it might be. Um, yeah. So we don't absorb it into your body. You know, I just thought of, Tim, how many times have you been at a live burn? Or I'll even go back to my FDIC uh, or uh, training, you know, uh, hot training classes, right? And you, you, they bring in the box lunches and you're sitting there outside 
and uh, you know you're grimy, you're dirty, your hands are dirty, and you're just tearing apart that piece of chicken or a piece of pizza that uh, they're feeding you, right? Because you know you don't even think about anything chafing off onto your hands or any sort of chemical exposure that's getting into your hands now into your food and now into your body. So. Wash, 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 wash. So is this stuff still in the gear today? I know you mentioned earlier the long chain, again, without getting too technical. I mean, what are we still use? we got to waterproof our gear. we got to make a, a good thermal barrier, a moisture wicking barrier. Uh, so what are they doing today? Is this stuff still in the gear? I don't want to scare people too much, but lo- what, what should we know? Yeah, all the, yeah all, the long ch- all the long chain stuff is out, and you can actually get gear that is – Free of that, you have to talk to the manufacturer to get the right uh, fabrics and stuff. But some of the short ch- chain stuff ones that are supposedly safe, uh, you can still find it. Um, the one thing that always concerns me, and we talked about it briefly, is okay, we're going to replace it with something. Uh, okay, I always get a little bit worried. We're going to replace something with what? Uh, right. Is 50 years from now, all of a sudden, our hands are just going to fall off? You know, so it's it's getting better. It's improving. And I think probably the best way to protect ourselves is not so much maybe the gear in this, in those products in the gears, but how we treat our gear and how we uh, use it. Um, we should be washing our gear. NPA uh, 1851, the, the care maintenance, they say to wash it twice a year. Well, my personal opinion is anytime you go to a working fire, wash your gear. Um, when I was chief uh, in 2006, we had a. I've been. I was always wanted to buy washer extractors for both stations. Um, it didn't go anywhere. We had a transfer garbage transfer station go up in my district. All everyone's gear smelled of burnt garbage, and I had gear scattered out through my battalion at different. We were out of service. None of, no one. We had enough spare gear to kind of staff a couple guys. Uh, the next meeting, we ordered two washer extractors. Um, and the policy was if, if you trashed up your gear, you washed it. If a line officer noticed your gear was getting really nasty, and this was before the big push for washing your gear, you were told, hey, wash your gear in the next couple of days or next week, yeah. or you're taking, it's going to be taken out of service. And the guy's like, oh, you won't do that. Well, what you do is you just take one boot away, and they go to a call, where's my boot? I'm like, you didn't wash your gear. Yeah. And they got the gear got washed really quickly. And uh, <laughs> sure, I noticed it where um, if you're going out, and I noticed especially as a chief officer, my gear was in the back of the Tahoe. And if you went to uh, you went to an away game and you got to go in and be an interior officer and your gear got all crapped up, you'd smell it in the back of your truck forever. The next time you put your gear on, you could be going out to dinner in 20 minutes with your wife all dressed up and you put it on, you're like, I need another shower. So I had a meeting with a three-star general at West Point. I had a uh, – it wasn't even my call. I stopped at a call on the way in because I drove past it. And he goes, this, or this senior office, chief, uh, general officer, I smell something burning. Oh, sir, mm. that's just me. It's, I had a fire on the way in. It, now you wash your gear. So I was doing it more for, hey, so you don't stink and take care of your maintenance. Yeah. And the guy yeah, used to be a gear from and say, got to wash it. It used to be a badge of honor to have the dirty, stinky gear. And I can tell you how many times I'd have my gear in my car and for a week after a tower drill or or a real fire, you'd smell it and maybe even longer than a week. And I'll tell you one thing you mentioned that, that uh, is concerning is, so we have to wear gear and we have gear and, and they're they're taking great strides to improve uh, what the gear is made up of and the protective chemicals that are added to the gear. But like you said, we what's great today, generations from now, things that are so obvious to them that are harmful, such as what you mentioned, asbestos, <laughs> PVCs, all that. Generations from now, things that are so obviously dangerous or harmful aren't so today. So we have no idea the long-term effects of whatever our gear is being made up of today. So it's just important to be aware. Um, please remember the latency period between exposure to a toxin and the onset of cancer can be anywhere up to 30 years for some types of cancers. Um, so many of the cancers today are due to exposures years ago. So this is a great unknown. So we've got to take the proper steps to protect ourselves and our firefighters. 
And even though we don't think about it that often, because, hey, it's turnout gear, we got to go to work and go put the fire out, maybe it's time to take it seriously. Now, can we do a full replacement? Probably not. It's certainly not within a lot of volunteer department's budget. Um, but what can we do? What can we as volunteers do who are facing a very tight budget to try and get some gear that at least is better than a generation or two ago? What can we do in our department to try and start a process of gear replacement? First is take a look what you have and where you, want, where you are and where you want to go. Um, <clears throat> Years ago, this is when I first started before the Internet was as big as it was. I started back in the, the late 90s when the Internet was just, just right after Al Gore invented it. So it really wasn't as uh, big as it is now. We were told, I remember, uh, oh, our PBI is better than their PBI or our Nomex is better. Nomex is Nomex is Nomex. PBI is no different manufacturer to manufacturer. So the fault, and I had actually a manufacturer come out and say, said, if someone says their material is better than somebody else's, they're lying. So right now we're already ahead of the game. Figure out what you need and figure out what you can afford. People think they need to go out and spend, get the highest cost outer shell, moisture barrier, thermal liner, the most expensive everything to have what they need. You can buy things that maybe don't cost as much. Maybe instead of buying the Cadillac, you're buying the Chevy. And there's nothing wrong with a Chevy. Um, also, take a think about what you're spending your money on in your budget. And this is going to be a bit of a soul search for some departments. Um, you have cheap trucks. Okay, when do you buy them? Um, we have one and we buy one every other year. Okay, can you maybe get an extra couple of years out of those? Uh, can you um, maybe not, uh, uh, instead of buying the $700,000 engine, can you maybe buy the $550,000 engine? Maybe don't put all those fancy extra lights and bells and whistles on it. Uh, maybe try to buy something a little bit more affordable. I'm not a commercial cab person, but there's a lot of ways to save money. If you're operating on a fire ground, you're in on the line, you're doing a search. Do you really care if you have the million and a half, the $2 million ladder truck out front or the $750,000 ladder truck that is a bunch of years old that passes inspection and she's an old war horse doing a great job and that pumper that maybe isn't the, the best looking truck in a parade, but boy can operate forever. You really don't care, but you want that gear to be holding up. So maybe look at some of your priorities. That's one thing to look at, and it's very much soul-searching. Next is looking to grants. Uh, there is a lot of money out there, but you have to sell what you need. Um, I honestly didn't think my department, when I wrote the grant for the gear, I, I, we earned a grant for gear and for new SCBAs. Um, I, I've been very lucky getting the FEMA grants. Um, I know a lot of people have done well with them. Sell your department. Sell your need. Um, you don't need to spend a lot of money on grant writers to do this. Find someone who has some technical writing skills. Find somebody maybe has some creative writing skills and get together and do it. It might take a couple tries. Go to your local businesses. Um, some of these corporations, I'm a mom and pop store type of guy. Um, they're the ones that will donate to Boy Scouts. They donate to my son's across league. They can't go out and give you a big check to go buy a bunch of gear. Some of these big corporations, they're moving into your district. Instead of asking for some assistance to go buy that brand new engine, hey, you want to know something? We could use some help to get us kind of started buying, replacing our gear. Maybe they can get a good slug of gear for you at a shot. Then you can have a good replacement policy. And then your replacement policy is yearly budgeting. Hey, every year we are going to buy this many sets of gear. And what's good about that is it's always going to replace gear as time goes on. And you should be replacing somebody's gear unless they ruin it before it's ruined. So you always have something to kind of fall back on where um, uh, my gear, I, I, I ripped the pant leg open pretty good on it on a call. Well, I used my own gear for a, a couple of weeks when they sent the pants out to get fixed. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so you can actually, you just have to kind of think about what you want to do and also what's important to you in your department. 
Right, right. So it takes some proper budgeting and some proper planning, like anything, like any good organization, and then and keeping your priorities in order. And uh, um, but all very good points and on, on where to start if 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 you need to plan a gear replacement program because it's something you have to do. And um, the the better gear you can get, the newer gear, you know, the better off you'll be. So. All very good thoughts, and I know one thing we can't say is, well, we shouldn't wear the gear, right? Um, I, I heard it, I saw it written that at a at a pretty uh, large uh, fire conference uh, a couple of years ago, um, there was actually a presenter there saying the smoke isn't our problem; it's our bunker gear. Our gear is dangerous, and I think that illustrates just how little information is uh, some people have as, as far as understanding the turnout gear certainly an unqualified statement to make because we need to wear our gear and yeah we talked about some issues we're finding about it but it's still better than getting burned and uh you know the studies certainly come to the same conclusion that exposure to smoke and other products of combustion that's our number one risk still so we still need to properly gear up, need to be a little more informed about how our gear is made and put together. Most definitely. The idea of uh, our, our gear is not safe. Uh, I, uh, then the next question is, okay, what, you want me to, what do you want me to wear? Well, they have to make safe gear. Well, it's not going to show up today. And then also, whatever they, all that gear they have, every set of PPE now until eternity is going to have some sort of and I hate to use the word chemical, but we'll just use the word chemical to help it perform better. There's nothing out there that doesn't have chemicals in it. So what we could be getting tomorrow for the new replacement could be worse down the road. Protect right. yourself. One of the biggest things that a lot of guys do, and uh, we talked about this a couple times, is you know, when do you really want to have your gear on? Well, if, if you're at a drill where you're doing – engine company operations, ladder company operations, you're stretching lines, throwing ladders, cutting a car, you should be donning your gear. When it's over, take it off. Um, we've all had those storm standbys where you're running and just um, do the same thing. I'll put my bunker pants on because you're going out, and I'll take everything off out of my pants on for hours. If you're back in the station for five minutes and go back out again, okay. If not, Take your pants off. You know, walk around in a pair of slippers. Um, our PPE should never be leaving our truck room. Um, think of um, your firehouse as your own home. Greasy, nasty, dirty, grimy coverall that you only use in your garage to work on the car or something like that. And if you stepped in the front door and your wife would scream at you, why would you walk in the house with your bunker gear on? Uh, and that goes to your your house and also, if you do a cover assignment, um, I try to remember now if I'm not, you know, I drive. I drive my bunker pants on. We have leather boots. I'll bring the shoes so when I get there, I can take my pants off and put my sneakers on. Um, I can't remember what department. They bought pink Crocs, pink. And if there's a standby company there, they're in the, in the uh, radio room. You take your gear off, you put on a pair of pink Crocs, and you walk around the station. So your PPE is not within the living areas. Um, most stations now, if you look at the living areas, no PPE beyond this point. Leave it out in the truck room. Keep it separate. Um, you know, if you're not doing something that you don't need it on, you know, don't have it on. Um, some departments now are issuing station wear for maintenance nights. Um, a lot of people, it used to be Dickie's pants, now it's like the 511s. Um, if you have like duty crews at your firehouse and that might be your drill night, some of the busier departments do that now, which are, I love the idea. That's a whole different thing we could talk about. Well, you're on your duty crew. You're wearing a pair of uh, like a 5'11 pants, a pair of boots and a, uh, some sort of a job shirt. You, know, you can do your truck checks or almost the entire truck check dressed like that. Uh, you don't need your bunker pants on to check an SCBA or check a hand light or check the radios or run the pump. Uh, throw the ladder, uh, you know, for the aerial in service, you know, figure about what you're wearing to your drills and maybe you put up a policy for, for a maintenance day or a maintenance night. Hey guys, you got to wear long pants, jeans are fine, sturdy shoes and a shirt. You don't need to put your PPE on to go and operate the pump panel at a maintenance and equipment night. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, the bottom line there is you're yeah. doing less in the gear than what maybe we used to do in the past. I mean, I've been on many a standby, and it always feels cool to be wearing your bunker gear while you're hanging out at the firehouse, even in your own firehouse sometimes when you've been busy running a bunch of runs and you keep the gear on so you're ready to rock and roll and you're walking into the club room area with it. And like you said, it's becoming less and less common to do that. But make yourself aware that, you know what, probably a good idea to take that bunker gear off even if uh, you're going to go on another run in 10 minutes because you're doing your body a good favor by doing that. Most definitely. And it's, and it's now that we're a little bit older, a little bit longer in the tooth, we see that. Um, the biggest thing is convincing the younger guys. Um, it, it, the idea of, uh, if you remember Andy Fredericks, you, know, you don't see a garbage man going around the corner of the back of a garbage truck and get excited when he sees garbage. Well, we shouldn't be doing that going to a fire. Right. Um, right. Everyone's been surprised at you know, pulling up to a call and going, oh, didn't expect that, um, which is fine. Regain your composure and, and, you know, and go for it. We had, a, we had a going away party for one of our guys who took a job down in uh, Virginia Beach. <clears throat> and I'm always pulling up as the first two engines usually pulling out. I, I'm stuck on truck duty all the time. It, it kills me. The, the bay doors were closed. I ran in. And all you hear is, who's this? Who's that? I'm like, uh-oh. Everyone was already on the way to go wish this this guy good, uh, goodbye. I rode seat in the, the engine. We, we took it to the fire and uh, I pulled up, gave a size up, pulled a second on the box. And someone says, you're boring on the radio. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a good you thing. Know, I, I, but everyone's had the, uh, the radio transmission that wasn't so perfect, but uh, you try to you know, have few, fewer of those and more of the basic ones. Right, right. So, again, a very important thing that we don't want to lose sight of here, folks. There's definitely some – you definitely still want to wear your turnout gear um, at fires and, and hazardous incidents because uh, it's just known and proven and obvious that it's going to protect you the way it should be and the way we expect it to. So wear your gear, but just be aware and take the proper precautions. And there's a lot you can do right now. And the actions that you can take to protect yourself are basically, uh, there's no expense associated with it to reduce your risk. So um, do less in the gear than maybe we used to do. We're obviously wearing it at fires and emergency incidents that require it. But maybe not all emergency runs do require it. Keep it out of the living areas of the fire station. Maybe you can wear different gear at non-fire events. I know there's a lot of studies and a lot of information coming out about different types of gear for motor vehicle accidents now and obviously EMS. And they're not even recommending anymore. And I think I'm correct in saying if there was an FDIC this year, they would not have allowed wearing turnout gear in the stair climb. It's starting to be looked frowned upon to be wearing gear on fun runs and stair climbs and uh, or working out in your gear or, like Tim said, just hanging out at the station. It's just not – it's being looked at as something we can do to limit – our exposure to any toxins that may be leaching out of the gear. Yeah, and I think that's a great idea. And it's what's interesting is um, I've been doing the stair climb with Jerry for uh, Jerry Knapp for a bunch of years. And last year he did it with his well, two years ago now he did it with his gear on. And uh, I always grab one of the SCBAs to wear that. And I go, well, how is that? And his answer was, well, that kind of sucked. And we talked about it. Um, for 2020's FDIC, and he's like, yeah, I'm not going to do it. I'm like, yeah, my gear was going to be there because I was going to do the engine company. I'm like, I'm not going to wear my gear I'll, because it's just between the heat stress and they're talking about all this other stuff. Um, I'll be honest, cancer scares me. Uh, uh, and it scares me, and it has nothing to do with the fire service, but unfortunately I lost both parents to cancer about two and a half years apart. Um, it was about a 15-year battle between the two of them nonstop. And I, I saw firsthand what um, cancer can do to a person and also a family. It didn't destroy my family. It brought, uh, it brought the five of us together. Um, it did put a lot of stress on my marriage because I was always worried about my parents. You know, my, par- my, my marriage is fine and all that. But the cancer is so scary that it scares me to get it where if I can pr- protect myself and my family, that's what I got to do. 
And that's what I think all everyone in the fire service needs to do because um, let's put this way: we're all type A personalities. We're all these badass, tough guys and tough girls that, you know, nothing, you don't want to have somebody have to help you eat or go to the bathroom or carry you because you're too sick because of your cancer. So the idea, if we can do simple things, wash your hands, uh, wash your gear after the run. When you get home and you had a, a run where you got all crapped up on, strip down, put your stuff in the washer and wash it. Wash it right away. Go take a long, hot shower. Don't kiss your wife when you get home because she was worried about you. Don't hug your child. Hey, give me five, give me 10 minutes. Let me take a shower. Let me, let me get the ache off me. Uh, protect yourself. Protect your family because let's face it, we don't know what's going to happen down the road. So every little bit of prevention we have now is in the future, and that's, that's what we need to do for ourselves, our family, and our brethren. Right, right. It's so important to clean the gear uh, regularly, too. Can, uh, I know there's different thoughts on cleaning gear, but I was wondering if you could go over a good clear uh, cleaning program. Uh, obviously, after every fire, after every training evolution that involves fire, anytime the gear gets all nitty-gritty dirty, um, you should be cleaning it. But you should probably get in the habit of a good cleaning throughout the course of the year as well, even if it hasn't been exposed to fire. Doesn't that help as well? It actually helps in a lot of ways. First, the NFPA uh, tells you just to wash it twice a year or when needed. My personal thought of when needed is you've been at a fire. Um, maybe it's not the guy operating the pump or the ladder. Um, if you're just doing outside stuff at the fire, maybe, maybe not. But if you were interior on a structure fire, if you were really up close to the car fire, get it washed. Get the crap off it. Um, a lot of people do do uh, gross decon right at the scene. Uh, a garden hose attachment off the engine pump panel, a brush and some soap and hose you off. I think it's a great idea. The issue is, um, you're out by Buffalo. I'm in the. We're, do you want to do that in February? Uh, so it might not be practical in some parts of the country. Sometimes of the year, if it's just not practical because the weather is too inclement, we'll get back, get your gear. Bag it and get it washed. Get it in the washer at your station. Um, clean out the inside of your rigs. Um, there's this big process now of clean cabs. Um, there's kind of two extremes. Doing nothing to clean cab. I think we should be in the middle. Um, specking out some new apparatus. Remember, you're, we're going back in age. We said the thick, nasty vinyl seats. Now what are they? They're nice cloth and soft. Well, some places are now talking and they're advertising in Fire Engineering Magazine. You can clean out our cabs. You can hose it off. Our latest three pieces of equipment we purchased have basically a bed liner inside the entire cab, so there's no soft surfaces. Um, clean inside your cabs. Clean your tools. Clean your SCBAs. Wash your gear. Wash your hands. Uh, don't bring your stuff home. Just by doing those basic things, almost have no cost. Uh, and you're protecting yourself at the greatest level. Um, to go spend millions of dollars on redesigning your cabs, your rigs and stuff, I'm not sure is the, the correct solution, but by simple policy changes, get some Hero Wipes. That's just one of the brands. There's a bunch of them out there. You know, wipe yourself down at the fire call. When you get back, get your stuff washed, either at your station or if you send it out, use some backup gear. Wash your hands. Make sure your guys take a shower when they get home. Um, some departments have washers and dryers at their stations to wash their personal clothing after call. Uh, washer and dryer you can get for a couple grand. You just make sure people need a change of clothes there. It's not hard to do if you think about it. The biggest thing is getting your people to buy into it, which can be challenging. You know, somebody pointed out to me that, you know, we all love the FDNY and looking at there, no one has uh, more action photos of, of firefighters in action and crusty firefighters than the FDNY. But someone pointed out to me that if you look at many of the photos coming out today with the FDNY, and they still fight probably more fire than a lot of cities and a lot of departments, they do a lot of action. But if you look closely at a lot of the photos coming out today, the scene photos don't show as many crusty, worn-out, dirty sets of gear on the backs of the firefighters that you might have seen a generation ago. 
I think they are really taking the steps in the world's biggest department to keep their gear clean and keep uh, good, clean gear on the backs of their firefighters. I thought that was a good point that that person made. Yeah, they actually, uh, we have a bunch of guys in the FDNY in my station, and this area being, you know, not even an hour from New York City, and they're issued two sets of gear. Um, they get back, their gear is all crusted up, they send it out, get it cleaned. Um, and they have uh, vehicles that go around and pick it up in a cycle. Um, I know a small career department by here, you go to a working fire, your gear automatically goes into the washer at the station, you start using your backup. Um, yeah. We have some, there are some small city departments that are a lot smaller than FDNY in Los Angeles and all these places. Like um, a lot of these places in North Jersey right now uh, are kind of, they're burning these two, three story wood frames almost on a daily basis. And they're getting multiple fires on a tour. Um, There's some volunteer departments that get a lot of calls. Um, The biggest thing is make sure you take care of your stuff and, you know, and have a policy. If your gear gets dirtied up, throw it and get it washed. Um, Right. Tim, what do you think about, you know, I think about, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, go, go, Tom. I was just gonna say, what do you think about? The, we've all done this. What about passing gear on to another department? You're doing them a favor, or so you think. You know, if, if your department's fortunate enough to have first generation gear and you're replacing it with new gear, but the old gear is not in that bad of shape, I think it's very common for a fire department to give it to a neighbor or a rural department that maybe doesn't have the funding of a more suburban department. And I bet you that's going to be looked at a little differently today. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it'll be looked at to the point of legality of uh, liabilities. Um, unfortunately, everybody sues everybody for everything. And I remember when we donated the gear when we got our, our we placed ours. Um, the district uh, just sent a little letter down, and it was actually cleared by our lawyer. Hey, we we understand some of this gear is outdated for the NFPA. Um, make sure you inspect it. You know, we you know basically hold harmless. I think you're going to see a lot more of that. I hope that um, the donations of, I'll just say, old equipment, might it be gear, might it be hose, might, whatever, to a place that doesn't have it, I hope doesn't stop because then you want to know something? Yeah, we got the new stuff. We got the better stuff. If we're giving them stuff and they're using it, how bad is the stuff that they have? Uh, so it's, it's, an, it's an improvement for them, and that's kind of scary where um, – you hear about, and we've, everyone's talked about it, the small volunteer fire department someplace in a rural area having a spaghetti dinner to make sure they can pay for the diesels to put in their rigs. Mm-hmm. That's scary. Yeah. Um, you know, we're talking about replacing our uh, our ladder trucks uh, 20 years old, and we've been having a lot of issues with it. Uh, we're going to spend over a million dollars on a ladder truck and within the next year or two. Okay, that's great. Uh, there's places that are looking to buy um, – 30-year-old engines, and that could be their first due. Right. Yep. Yeah. Great, dis- it's, so uh, it's- great disparities in the volunteer fire service as far as funding and and having an adequate budget, no doubt about it. What What is the recommended length that, uh, for, for a life of turnout gear? When, is there a standard on that? Like, um, again, I know firefighters, if their gear is 10 years old, oh, we need new gear, it's 10 years old, but they haven't been in a structure fire. So what, what's a good that guideline is, on how is- long? That is actually the NFPA standard is 10 years from the born on date. And I think that has a lot to do with uh, going over multiple cycles of the NFPA being updated and also just wear and tear. Um, What's funny is uh, you can have a gear in a rack in a dark room and take it out or if it's in a box and it's fine. But if you have your gear out in the sun and the UV light will beat it up and ruin it. Um, if you remember way back when people had the the coat on the back coat hung up in the back window of their truck and their helmet on the rack and the UV light would just break it down and ruin it. So it wouldn't even make it ten years. Their standard with the NFPA is ten years because it's thinking it's the interior guy, it's the guy doing the do. So maybe gear that's over ten years older and if the guy's only a chauffeur. Um, our department now, if the guys are a little bit older, and hey, I'm, I'm only a chauffeur now, they're buying them turnout gear that's just for, they're basically buying like tech rescue type stuff because um, one, it's cheaper, 
and they're not going to replace it as much where they can put the money towards the interior guys that still need that expensive garment. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Did you just hit on a topic for back to when we talked about what we can do today? And this is, I'm, I'm thinking on my feet here, so if I say something so stupid, I apologize. Is that possibly something we can do today to help protect our members? And that is to buy them a different type of garment or protection if they are, a, let's say, a driver only or a scene support member only that maybe they don't need the fully encapsulated gear that may or may not have some of the chemicals we were talking about? I don't know. Does does that make sense? Yeah, I've actually talked about that in one of my articles where if you think about it, our, our structural gear is designed for structural use. It's not for brush fires. It's not for medical calls. It's not for extrication. Where when we bought all our gear, there was a debate uh, back and forth. Do we buy structural gear and also turnout gear for extrication? We basically covered two interstates, and we had a lot of MVAs. And we we're damaging and ruining sets of gear at car accidents every year. Uh, you get hung up on a piece of metal. You got uh, grease, oil, gas, fluids. And we decided not to because it just, it just wasn't the – it was really close. It could have gone the other way. But we did switch to extrication gloves for everybody because we were ruining more gloves than anything else. Uh, a lot of departments now, especially bigger ones, they're actually, if they run EMS calls, they'll have EMS gear um, or something like that, which makes sense. It's lighter, but then the one thing you have to remember, if you're on an EMS rod, where's your structural gear? Because you know you're going to be, uh, you're going to turn over right. the patient to the EMS, to the ambulance, and yep. you to get hit for a structure fire, you'd be like, damn it, my stuff's back yep. at the station. So you have to yep. set your policy See that up. But definitely, buy multiple sets of gear, um, firehouse that's shared. You use it, you wash it. But if we have a big brush fire, we break out that stuff instead of using our structural gear. Yeah, yeah. Two uh, two quick things. I know we've got to wrap it up here. We've been going an hour and a half, and I could talk to you for another hour and a half. But I just two quick things I want to make sure I highlight. You mentioned it already, but I, I, we might have skipped over it quickly. I think it's important for the listeners to know that sunlight can degrade the gear. In my station, we've got uh, beautiful glass apparatus bay doors, and we have our gear hanging on racks. And we took steps to put uh, UV film on the on the bay doors because we want to limit the sunlight coming in because it can very, uh, it can degrade the gear. Can it not? That is a hundred percent accurate. Uh, if you think about, um, think about your car, especially red, red is one of those colors that fades wonderfully in the sunlight. Um, or anything that gets sunlight. Uh, I'm looking, I'm in my son's room and his curtains are dark blue and the, and the front of our house gets beat up. It faced the West. The spots that face the West get beat up the most. Because uh, UV light, uh, films on the windows of your truck room is important. If it's in the back of a chief vehicle, is it in a some sort of a box where it's just the sun's not beating on it and just degrading it? Um, that's basically protecting your investment. Uh, sure, it costs money to put a film on a glass bay door. Um, I think the glass bay doors are awesome. I, I thought I've always think they look really attractive as an engineer building buildings, but the cons are. Well, you know, let all that light in, it can damage stuff. Well, these new films, get a film put on. You can actually have that film put on the doors years afterwards, and it's really not that expensive. Right. It's yeah, we didn't find it that expensive it's, at all. It's thinking thinking out of the box. What can you do to protect your investment? Yeah, and that's, for sure. You know, what you want to do and sell to the taxpayer. And the other thing I wanted to ask you is gear inspections. Like somebody should be checking the gear, correct? Obviously, a fire chief everyone looks to or commissioners or a captain, but somebody should be keeping an eye on your firefighter's gear. And should we be doing a yearly inspection of it as well? You should be doing a full inspection every time it's clean because there's a purpose for it to be cleaned and any time you think there might be damage. Um, the inspection, it's not too hard to inspect your gear. It's a lot of common sense stuff. But what I'd recommend is whoever your supplier of your gear is, your manufacturer, then your, then your local rep, have not the salesperson, have a technical rep come in and teach a bunch of guys, hey, this is how you inspect your gear. You take the outer shell off your, your inner parts. 
what do you look for? You look at the seams. Are the seams good? Are there any burn marks? Um, your moisture barrier, it, there are a lot of them are like this off-white or white. Well, if it's turning brown, did they get burned? Did I have black gear, but now it looks orange from heat? It might not be damaged. It's just burning off the dyes. But if I have an orange spot on my shoulder, I might want to look at my moisture barrier in that spot to see if there's any damage. Um, if I'm just out in the rain and for some reason my left shoulder gets drenched in two minutes, well, there's a failure someplace in my gear if the rest of my body is dry. Um, do I have a big hole, gaping hole? Um, a little hole down by your ankle because you got hung up with something. Should it be fixed? Sure. Get it fixed at your next, you know, available time. Is that as important as a big rip on your back? Right. No. You know, and, and use some common sense. And then also have some people get smart on it. They should know how to put your DRD device back together. I've seen guys. I was going to ask about that. When you clean your gear, first of all, separate the inner liner from the outer liner, mm-hmm. which some people take shortcuts there and don't want to do that. But that's very important to do. Again, we want to rid the carcinogens. We want to rid these chemicals from our gear. And if you're if they're if they're transferring from you know from um, the outer shell to the inner shell or whatever, you want to get them out of the gear. You've got to separate the gear that's number one and then number two you got to make sure you put it back together correctly and if you don't know there's no harm there find someone that does learn how to do it and if you're an officer i'm sure everyone has a captain or lieutenant or whoever in charge of their turnout gear make sure they know how to teach the members how to put it together properly as professionals we should understand and know about our gear exactly what's interesting is uh, a bunch of years ago i wrote about the idea of uh Guys can name the pump size, tank size, year it was manufactured, uh, the specs on the axles on the rig and all this. Who's a manufacturer of your gear? And they might get that. What's, wh- what is it comprised of? What's your outer shell? What's your moisture barrier? And guys will look at you like a deer in the headlights. You don't need to know the nitty-gritty about your gear down to the spec of it, but understand the components and how to look at it and make sure it's okay. And if you don't, you know, it's, you know what that is? That's a great pocket drill. Um, the pocket drill is go. where something fell apart, you know, for a drill on a yep. night because you, it just maybe we still, everyone drills in inclement weather, but sometimes it's just too inclement. Well, pull out a set of gear and take it apart. You know, not your own gear because you know your gear is going to be three quarters apart and you get hit for a good job. You do it to your buddy so he can't go. And <laughs> explain to him what the parts are. Hey, there this you is go. the outer shell. This is this. This is what you look at. Hey, this is your moisture barrier. These are the places where it's probably going to fail the soonest. This is how you put it back together. This is how you take it apart. You know, you turn it inside out and soak the thermal liners out when you wash it. Zip it up. Close the Velcro on the outer shell when you put, you put those together so the Velcro doesn't damage stuff. Make sure everything's out of your pockets. Who's got a toolbox in your pockets? I do. You know, how do you protect your pockets from your toolbox in your pockets? And, oh, by the yeah. way, here's what we're finding out about it today and steps we need to take to protect ourselves any hazards associated with the gear or may be associated with the gear winter's coming there's a great inside drill there's a great pocket drill as you so eloquently put it great idea fantastic drill idea. And, it's, and, it's, it's, and you can make it interesting you don't have to make it boring you don't have to be a chemist you don't have to be an engineer no 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 disrespect meant there tim but <laughs> Make it simple for the guys and gals. Make it simple. Here's your gear. Let's talk about it for half an hour. Let's understand how it's put together as you take your buddy's gear apart. And then talk about the known hazards that may or may not be in your gear and the steps you can take no matter what gear you have to better protect yourself. Great drill idea. Great topic. We could go on and on all night on this. I think I will have you back on a future show. We'll talk about specking gear. We can get into helmets and hoods and boots and all that as well. But, uh, um, Tim, if you wouldn't mind, I'm sure there's some people that maybe have some questions or comments, and they may want to reach out to you. So, first of all, if you ever get a chance to sit in on any of Tim's classes, be it on the volunteer fire service, leadership, engine work, any of that, I highly recommend it. It'd be a great, great presentation for you to take in. If anyone wants to reach out to you, Tim, how can they get a hold of you? Easiest way is two parts. Uh, Everyone can laugh. I still have an AOL email account. uh, Me too, brother. I'm there with you. (laughs) Yep. It's 
two things. You can do that, and then it's a T P P five nine at AOL dot com. If not, everybody's on Facebook. If you Google me or search me on Facebook, send me a message. Um, what's great is with social media, we talked about this on the whole on the, the good and bad and the ugly with it. It's a great way to stay connected. We use it on my side for my family. It's kind of scattered now. We send pictures of uh, our kids and all that. Uh, we communicate back and forth on it, you know, unjokingly and stuff. And it's a great way to contact somebody in the fire service where maybe you read an article. That's how I contacted you. I actually use Diane from Fire Engineering. But to reach out, um, I'm easy to find. It's, it's Tim Pillsworth. It's spelled just like it sounds if you Googled it. And uh, reach out, and I will reply back to you usually within a day or so. Hey, I got your message. Um, I'm a little busy. I'll, get, I'll, I'll reach back to you next week. I'm still heavily involved in my Boy Scout troop, and I might be getting ready for a camping trip. So, But uh, I always reply back, and I'll give as much help to anybody I can because, let's face it, um, uh, Chris Flatley, a retired FDNY cap, and his joke is, I got a guy. And uh, he's thrown me to the wolves a couple times speaking to some guys uh, that he knows on gear. But if you find some that you can get information from, use them. Um, your local representatives that, from your salespeople, find the ones that work with you and use their brains and help them do the research. It, there's a lot of information and also the, the, uh, the wonderful Internet. It, I wish it was like there is now where I didn't have to go call up manufacturers and have them send me books of pamphlets. Now everything's online. You just save a, save a tab and do your homework. But if you have a question, please reach out, and I'll, I'll point you in the, in the best direction I can. Oh, that's awesome. And can you do your email address one more time, but do it phonetically? So it's T Tim and P. Was it P Peter? What is it? T. Yep, it, it's T Tim, P as in Patrick, P as in Pillsworth, the number 59 at AOL. Uh, very good. Well, listen, I want to thank you for for persevering and dialing in 10 or 12 times to finally get through. Um, I really appreciate you spending uh, what I thought would be an hour, but an hour and 45 minutes or so talking turnout Holy here. Crap, all it's things. been that long. It has been, and we're um, as I'm sure you know, there's more we could talk about. And listeners, um, please reach out to Tim or myself if you have any questions or things to add And uh, because uh, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to know with our turnout gear. So, Tim, thank you so very much for being on here tonight. I appreciate it. And I look forward to having that beer with you at FDIC, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you before then. I hope so because I tell you, the uh... – we all missed FDIC. That was our battery charging thing for the year. And I just hope that uh, not just you, but everybody is doing okay with this mess. And it's uh, figure out what's under your control and control it. And the rest of the stuff, just hold on tight because it's been a bumpy road. And let's all hope that things get uh, better for everybody soon. Let's hope so, my brother. Let's hope so. So thanks again, Tim. I appreciate you being here, man. We'll talk to you down the road. Be safe. And uh, we'll be talking... I guarantee we'll probably be on the phone sometime tomorrow. Probably. I look forward to it, brother. Thank you. <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. A lot to know, a lot to understand about our turnout gear, including the relatively new information concerning uh, certain chemicals are maybe added to the gear that could cause some harm, and even though when it's added in a stable state over time, it can decay and somehow get into us as firefighters, and we're very concerned about that, and Oh, the chemical agents certainly are used in a wide variety and wide range of consumer goods from upholstery to athletic wear, and the health impacts extend beyond the firefighting world. So can our bunker beer be, can our bunker gear be dangerous? I say, and I know Tim shares the sentiment, compared to not using it, no, absolutely not. There's no reason to think that we need to change our behavior when wearing our gear as far as wearing it for structural firefighting. Not wearing it and trying to do our job, I think you know the answer there and what the problem would be. But changes are coming. You know, there's no doubt about it. New studies are coming out, which are going to provide even more information. Matter of fact, NIOSH is coming out with a recent study on it. Uh, I read the University of Arizona. They received a $1.5 million research grant to study the effects of PFAS in firefighting foam and gear and its effect on firefighters' health. So, 
more uh, information is going to be coming out. But please also keep in mind that there are thousands of PFAS chemicals and only a limited number have been deemed harmful to human health. And the ones that are known to be harmful, such as maybe some that were put in our turnout gear, efforts have been taken or are underway currently to eliminate those from the manufacturing in the United States. Nothing's going to change overnight. Nobody did anything wrong here either. It's not made, uh, these weren't added purposely. It's just information that's coming out, some very well-intentioned um, chemicals that were added. But we just need to be aware. We need to take the steps that are necessary to protect ourselves. And like wearing our SCBA is just the way it is today, no one even questions donning an SCBA. Well, whatever replaces the chemicals that are in the gear now and in the future, we need to just be confident um, that they're not going to be as toxic and the proper steps are going to be taken to mitigate the risk. And just as I said, just like wearing SCBA is the way it is today, so will donning and doffing turnout gear continue to be. So I want to thank you for listening in this evening. Um, please reach out to Tim if you have any more questions. I'd like to again thank Fire Engineering and Chief Bobby Halton and Clarion Events for supporting the podcast. And uh, if anyone would like to reach out to me, I also have the AOL email address, tamerrill63 at aol.com. Again, you can check out any of my social media platforms that are dedicated to our professional volunteer fire service, including my Facebook page, the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. I'm on Instagram, Twitter. I'm always posting informational articles and words of wisdom and motivational tidbits of information to help us all better navigate our volunteer fire service world. I do have a YouTube channel now, the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. I have all my podcasts listed there. This one will be up tomorrow or the next day. I also have some cool historical videos videos on that channel as well because I'm a huge history buff, fire service history buff, so I've got a lot of history videos on there. So please 
Check out the Professional Volunteer Fire Department YouTube channel. Subscribe to it. Check out any of my sites. If you want to get a hold of me, if you'd like me to come out and do a presentation on professionalism, leadership in the volunteer fire service, history of the fire service, please reach out to me, T.A. Merrill, 63 at AOL.com. And I'm going to have a lot more coming for you. My next show will be Tuesday, December 22nd, and I look forward to again talking about our great volunteer fire service and, of course, sharing topics and events that are so important to all of us. So, again, thanks for tuning in tonight. Thanks to Tim Pillsworth for taking the time. Thanks to Clarion Events, Fire Engineering, and Chief Halton for sponsoring the podcast. And, folks, developing, maintaining, and portraying a professional image is the duty and responsibility of all firefighters, paid or volunteer. Here. It's really that simple. No matter where you are or who you serve, your residents are owed professional service delivered by professional firefighters representing a professional organization. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you again December 22nd. Stay safe.